go. <laughs> so I'll be uh, giving a little bit of a mobile robotics uh, perspective on computer vision tasks. So I'm, I'm kind of really working at this intersection between the two domains. So I'm... Uh, oh, can I just have me too? There we go. Okay, so these are some of the applications that, that I have in mind. On the left-hand side, you see are the kind of domestic robotics applications. I'm also working within the Dyson Robotics Lab together with Andy Davidson. Um, so some of the work that I'll be showing uh, will be coming out of that lab. Um, in, on the side of the Smart Robotics Lab, we're mostly interested in, in applying stuff to, uh, to drones these days. So that's the, the main application um, over there. So just a very quick um, overview of how mobile robotics has been um, done traditionally. Um, you would really break down the real-time control loop into different modules. You would have a kind of a perception side of things. You would have some kind of estimation module that would doing the whole slam and whatever in there, then feeding the outputs to uh, cognition, path planning, some high, higher level task planning as well. Finally, motion control, you act, your state of the robot uh, changes with respect to the world, the whole thing repeats. You're building up some kind of a map towards the robot, uh, maybe you have some prior knowledge as well, and the, the good thing about that is that as, if you're a user um, or someone who debugs the system, you can introspect it, you know what's going on. Uh, we're using the same kind of uh, semantics, the same kind of constructs um, on board the robot uh, that, we, that we also use as humans. So that's, that's definitely an advantage. Also, if you're an operator, you can now refer to, to, to elements in the scene and so on. So, so that's, that's been, I think, the, uh, the very, very, for a long time, the traditional uh, way to go. But very clearly, we know that the main problem really with that is, and that's why autonomous driving isn't quite here yet, is that there is still a gap between the sort of sensing side and, and the higher level uh, AI side, if you want. Um, so the, the representations that we find are not quite robust or expressive enough, and then the, the whole thing breaks down. So the obvious alternative is, of course, to now do deep learning end-to-end, -end, just replace quite literally that gap with something which is which is a box on its own um, and you, you don't have the problem anymore, you can directly map uh, sensing uh, sensor inputs to, to, uh, to actions. Now, I think this approach has been quite successful in, in computer vision for, for specific tasks, also for specific robotic tasks. But I think it, it kind of fundamentally breaks down once you're trying to solve more complex tasks. Once you're, once you're um, posing a task, robotic task, at the more abstract level, uh, things like help the elderly as your kind of utility function, then it, it doesn't work anymore. Right? We, we, don't have, we don't have the data to do that. Uh, it would need too much, basically. Also, at some point, if you're doing robotics, you can no longer work with, uh, with data sets, right? But we, we should, sometimes I think we forget that, that you're interacting with the real world. You cannot use simulation. You cannot use data sets anymore. You have to actually deploy the robots in the real world. And then you're bound by real-time constraints of this, whole, uh, of this whole cycle. And you're going to bother actual people um, in, in your training process. So this is, I still think this is it's relatively far out. We can... We can train uh, robots doing really complex things in this complete end-to-end -end manner. So I think in, before we get there, if we ever get there, we'll, we'll have to be more pragmatic and we'll have to leverage deep learning in the individual blocks in a more traditional system where we can constrain uh, sub-problems in, in a simpler way that are not as data-hungry, that are somewhat tractable to train, and we can combine that with also the knowledge that we have uh, from geometry, for instance, from physics, and we can, we can factor, we can leverage all of that. And obviously some of the talks that, uh, that we've seen today go in exactly in that direction, that you can, in the perception part here, and for, for state estimation and mapping, you can use deep learning for data association, that's obviously um, the way to go. So a lot of the talk will be kind of um, centered around uh, um, these thoughts. So, so here's a, a quick example, just to give you a full example of, a, of an actual mobile robot, which is completely autonomous, but it actually doesn't use any learning at all, just to say that you can do some stuff completely without learning. Um, it's a quite traditional system if you want to have uh, onboard processing, an Intel NUC, uh, DJI airframe, uh, and then there is a, a real sense RGB D camera with an inertial sensor in there as well, and then we are running a visual inertial SLAM on board there. 
There's a, a downward-looking camera as well. The downward-looking camera is supposed to identify and track a moving vehicle, and then the goal is to uh, to follow it around and land on this thing. So, <coughs> so sparse visual inertial slant. There's not much of a of a map here. It's it's fully autonomous, but quite pre-programmed. So the drone is going around. <laughs> the drone is going around trying to find that moving thing, and it will uh, follow it, approach, and land on there. And the tricky bit is not doing that once. Really, the difficult thing is that you you have to do this in any kind of circumstances with with wind at different speeds, uh, with the sun coming out and things like that. So um, making it robust, that's, that's absolutely key, right? So we have two things, we have real-time control loop, so we have very hard uh, constraints on, on the computation, also there's limited uh, computational power available, and then we have the robustness, obviously accuracy to, to even get it all done as well. So that's, that's really what makes it challenging in robotics. Um, so with that in mind, what I will be doing is show some of the um, older and newer works in uh, simultaneous localization and mapping that we've been doing. Also along the lines of multi-sensors, I know this is a computer vision audience mostly here, but uh, um, especially the inertial part, for instance, is something that's been absolutely crucial um, in robotics. Um, then with the idea of going further towards spatial understanding, uh, beyond geometry, including semantics, object level understanding, and ideally also motion in the scene. I'll briefly touch on um, also data sets that we have been creating um, for evaluation and training, and then finally some application to uh, the robot spec applications. So, so here's just a quick example of what I mean by state. Um, we are used to, from computer vision, probably that we just mean position and orientation, um, but usually the the yeah, state vector can be more complex than that, so we might have, of course, position and orientation to, to, to do any control, but then we might need velocity, uh, we might include uh, extrinsics calibration, uh, relative position and orientations of, in this case, two cameras, it's a stereo setting here, um, but also we might have some form of intrinsics, uh, like inertial uh, biases, accelerometer and, and gyroscope biases, so usually it's really the physical robot states that we, we need to control it uh, combined with some nuisances, extrinsics and extrinsics that we need to estimate in order to get the, the accuracy. Um, so on, on the side of the uh, representation of the environment, of course, it is somewhat obvious that there is a lot of choices as well. Um, I will show you a couple of examples of different uh, um, ways of how to express the environment. So, so here, just to go back to the uh, um, more traditional systems, this is something that we have done um, about four years ago now with, with Ocvis, where we're combining visual and inertial constraints. So this is a very simple, sparse um, landmark map that the system is building. So we see a data association via uh, key points. This is not even deep learning based. Um, and then you can combine that division problem um, which, is, which is posed here as a bundle adjustment problem, essentially minimizing a cost function, minimizing the projection error um, over all cameras over time, using a factor graph representation as well. So we have projection error in all the camera poses here over time um, of all of these landmarks that are being observed. Um, and so this is a, it's, it's a least squares optimization problem. Now if you are extending it uh, to include also inertial measurement units, um, it can be done actually in a quite straightforward way, because um, if we are rating them with the inverse covariances um, that we know from, from a probabilistic sensor model, we can just easily augment the, uh, the, the cost function from um, the projection error with also uh, including those temporal IMU constraints here that link uh, camera frames as taken over time and insert these kind of temporal constraints. So this is the, the factor graph structure of the visual inertial uh, batch optimization problem that we can then solve. And so here is a, just a quick example, that's what was, was running on board the drone that I've shown. Um, of course this, this batch optimization problem keeps growing, it's not tractable over time. So what we have done here in, in this work, which is also open source and real time, you can try it out, is um, we, we, um, we're using keyframing 
and we are using concept of marginalization of old states um, and, and some landmarks to keep the problem bounded. Um, and yeah, so here you can see the output, trajectory, uh, 3D, sparse 3D landmarks, and the point is that this really works now very robustly. So you can see also in, in aggressive motion, um, and in a second, so there's quite fast motion here, and in a second it's going into the dark, and then that, that's where you get to start, to, you, you start to see really the benefit of such a system that if you were to do just plain computer vision in a, in a setting like this, it's just really hard, um, and with combining it with uh, inertial measurements in this kind of tight way, um, the problem becomes just kind of naturally uh, tractable. Okay, so this is a relatively basic building block. Um, it's similar things that are these days in uh, commercially available products even. Um, so that's, that's now become the kind of state of the art to do things in that way, to do accurate post tracking. But of course, we need more than just the pose. Uh, we are interested in a more um, um, expressive um, representation for the environment. So more recently, we have really focused on dense mapping in the lab. So um, in, in dense mapping, we, um, we usually use both um, ICP error terms when we have depth cameras available. So we can use projective data association. We did some dense geometry and, uh, and depth measurements. And you can sum them all, and sum over all pixels. And at the same time, we can use photometric error, where we effectively, again, using projective association, we can just get the colors and of all pixels to match. So that's, of course, all familiar. Um, and we can combine these two things together. So, system going again two, three years back that uh, was using exactly that combination for tracking was uh, elastic fusion, which puts together the circle map. And now the, the, the innovation that we did with that system was that you've just seen it as it snapped in place. Um, of course, you have drift when you're closing loops. It would identify these loop closures and rather than optimizing a kind of post graph to, uh, to fix things, it would directly optimize on the map. So you have this <coughs> sparse deformation graph that is sampled from these millions of surfles, surface elements, um, and you can deform, effectively warp the whole space in a kind of continuous way um, back in place. And at the same time, you can also, of course, warp the uh, trajectory of the camera so implicitly you get also kind of post graph uh, deformation if you want. But the idea with that was that the longer you go around and, and use your camera, uh, exploring a scene and closing little loops, coming back to where you've been, the, the better the reconstruction should get. And uh, it shouldn't kind of reinsert new surface elements, just kind of converge to a, a fixed representation of the environment. So a bit, in, a bit more details. Um, what we're doing is that we have a, a, the new part of the map which we trust to track the camera from um, and also to fuse new information, new depth information and color information into and then we're constantly trying to match that new part of the map with respect to the old part, the kind of grayed out part of the map and, and just always stitch these things together so there's these little constraints between the geometries that are being inserted um, whenever little loop closures or, or large loop closures happen and the, uh, the post graph optimization here runs on the CPU, so that's a relatively easy problem to solve actually. Whereas the tracking um, is, is a, a kind of a dense problem, and we, we, use, we heavily use the GPU for, for that one. Okay. So we've also now um, extended this system towards the inclusion of um, an inertial measurement unit. Um, so we can again kind of formulate this as a, as a, a factor graph problem. It's, it's actually a very simple factor graph if we have only compute division uh, being considered here because what we essentially do in these kind of dense systems is that we assume that the geometry is constant. We don't optimize simultaneously for the 3D geometry as in the system I've shown before. We only optimize for the current pose. It's a very simple pose graph. But as soon as you bring in the inertial measurement unit, uh, things have to be changed a bit and, and made a bit more... Uh, 
complicate it a little bit. So the way we formulated it here is that we, um, we inserted uh, this kind of temporal constraint between two poses over time, and then we have a linear prior, so it becomes a kind of a, a Kalman filter type uh, system that we optimize rather than just optimizing for the current pose. So this uh, effectively means that things work more robustly, more reliably. Just a couple of uh, examples here, I'll skip through some part of it. You can see here a comparison. This is now with the uh, real sense camera. We lose a bit of the details um, as opposed to the last example. But you get a lot more robustness, effectively. And you can see just in a second the comparison. So on the left hand side it's RGBD only, on the right hand side it's uh, with inertial. So we have a lot reduced drift. This is now with the loop closure actually being disabled so to, to, to visualize uh, the difference in drift that you get. So you get the much better starting point for, for your slam problem. Okay. Another quick point that I wanted to make was about um, representation. So this surface based representation of the environment is, is, is relatively easy to do and looks relatively nice if you zoom out. Um, if you are operating at a sort of constant distance to the structure, but um, it's it's also easy to then miss details and to, to not be able to deal with um, the fact that your camera can move closer to the structure or further away. So we, we have been uh, looking into this problem and uh, posed the, the reconstruction problem as a, as a kind of multi-scale, multi-resolution problem where you have to just keep, stop that for a second here. Uh, the representation is basically consisting of a, of a base, in this case just height field, we don't have a full 3D representation here in this case, um, a height map, and then a kind of difference map at higher resolution, so you always get double the resolution here, and effectively then the, uh, the overall map representation is always the sum of the base map and these incremental maps at high resolution. In this way you can now choose at what level you want to stop, so if you're further away from the structure, you can stop already here, and this is your representation, and if you're closer, you can stop here. This very nicely integrates with, a, with the course to find uh, map fusion in this case. So, here we show the system in action. You see here, these are the depth maps that are being created, that are then fused into this map. And this is actually a fully monocular system, so the depth map, they are here not coming from a from depth camera, even though they could as well, but they are reconstructed from a, from a separate uh, SLAM system, actually Orb SLAM that we are running here. Um, so they're just multi-view depth reconstructions, and then they're being fused into this grid. And as you can see now, the camera moves closer to, to some of these details, and we can adaptively now refine the, the resolution, and we can resolve little details as we go. <coughs> So I just wanted to also show that because I think it's an important aspect, especially showing in monocular SLAM when you can have larger scale um, depth further away and you can resolve fine details close by. So it's just showing the comparison now to elastic fusion. So if you use the same scheme with just this kind of circle based fusion, um, you, you suffer exactly the problem as I explained that you uh, you can't resolve these details. At some point, you're committing to to your circles, um, and it's very hard to to fix it, and you end up with this kind of you know, soup and mess of, uh, of of individual points, and you can't resolve it any further. So here's just a quick example of. Uh, actually showing the levels of detail that have been chosen, so the, the more yellow it is, it is uh, the higher the resolution. Okay. So now finally about learning. Of 
course, the next level is some form of semantic understanding of the world. And we have extended this elastic fusion system that I've shown towards one which, in a relatively straightforward manner, um, also uses a pre-trained convolutional neural network where the same input is being fed through in order to then label the 3D scene. And, uh, of course, this could be very useful for, for a robot, so you can now tell it to navigate on the floor to make it clean underneath the bed um, or whatever. So we have the, the slam reconstruction on the right side here, same thing as, be, as before, and the pre-trained neural network output uh, that runs not quite at real time, it's also not really needed, we're running it at about 5 hertz or so, um, and then we have a fusion process which does it at the per surface element independent way, that you, you basically get an update from every pixel uh, as the probability maps coming out of the CNN, and you, you just update in a phase-in way um, the, the probability distribution, the semantic pro uh, distribution for every uh, surface element. Okay, so this, this could already be quite useful for, for a robot, uh, but um, what, we, what we don't yet have is a notion of objects. So you just kind of go around and you paint the 3D world with some kind of semantic information, um, and, and, and that's it. So um, in, in the more recent work, what we have done um, was creating the system Fusion++, Plus Plus, which would really reconstruct individual objects and build a very much object-centric map. So again, here this is now um, again an RGBD system, right? So you can see in this case we're running um, mask or CNN to detect at instance level these objects, and they're being inserted now as you go into the map and are being reconstructed and refined uh, as we go. So they're not previously known objects, right? They're really being uh, reconstructed at the same time as the, the camera motion is also constructed. And I think the interesting bit about it is also that now our these, these um, objects that we are reconstructing are becoming the, uh, the landmarks of the map, if you want. So we can put together this kind of graph that links together observations in the cameras with these 3D um, objects. And we can... <coughs> we can formulate a bundle adjustment problem that optimizes the 60 poses of all of those objects together with the camera locations and, and orientations. So we can go back to a kind of more probabilistically correct system that optimizes structure and, and cameras. And of course the edges here that are formulated, they are, they are being uh, um, constructed from the actual, from the actual photometric error residuals. So we can now have a, a, a probabilistically meaningful uh, interpretation of that. And of course, we have robotic application in mind. I mean, we would like to do things like manipulation. We would like to refer to elements in the map, objects in the map. Let's keep some of the details here, and I'll uh, go to, um, if you want, somewhat an extension of this work, where essentially we are, again, focusing on... Um, an object-centric representation of the world, but now we are extending it where we can actually move these things around. Obviously, in the real world, things are not always completely static, and so we, uh, we built this system mid-fusion. Again, starting with uh, object-level, instance-level segmentation at the per-image uh, per um, level, and and then you have a tracking process, tracking the camera initially, finding visible objects, finding the moving objects by evaluating the, uh, the photometric and ICP residuals. And then once we have identified the moving objects, we can also go back and refine the, uh, the uh, initial camera tracking and we can track the individual objects individually. So there's no, there's no uh, learning of motion as such. The, the, the motion identification is purely coming from photo consistency and from, from ICP consistency in this case. And then we are fusing the new information at the per object level. So basically every object here is just its own uh, volumetric uh, map. 
the, uh, the, the choice of the representation here is actually octree based. So um, that kind of links back to what I was saying before about multi-resolution. And it's a very scalable um, formulation because um, what, 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 you would, what you would find in practice is that you see an object only part, partly first, um, and then you can continue to explore and grow it in any direction as you go and, and reconstruct that object in a in quite natural way if you're using this octree-based representation. And this is just some example here to show that uh, it's quite easy also to mask out people because we don't want people to go into the map. Um, I'll skip through some of that. Of course, also the colors that you can see here, um, they're actually the, the semantic classes, so we have still a kind of a semantic fusion uh, part in the whole process as well. So they, they should be consistent, consistently identified as correct classes too. Of course, uh, now again, the idea is to use that in a, in a robotic, mobile robotic context, manipulation or referring of these objects. So, talking a little bit more about um, bringing together geometry and learning, uh, Roni has already mentioned this system in, in, in the morning, so I'll kind of skip through. Um, the Code Slam system was, was all about uh, finding a, a, a more meaningful representation for 3D geometry, or dense 3D geometry, um, than something like a, a million depth values that describe it um, in this case. And we were learning an autoencoder to represent the depth map. So the idea is here that you have a fully supervised training of an autoencoder. Um, this is, this is in, inside the uh, um, CNET data set where you have ground truth of everything. Right? So you can train this autoencoder. And it's the idea of having this um, conditional decoder here uh, test time, you would you would have a, a code that you can optimize that represents the depth in here, but you can still leverage the uh, RGB input image here that you get at <coughs> test time um, in order to refine the details, um, to preserve the details in this, uh, in this depth reconstruction. So the idea is to construct a, a monocular SLAM system in which you can now optimize this code that represents the dense geometry together with the poses of the camera that goes around, right? So this is, it becomes like, again, a bundle adjustment problem where you have all of these poses, camera poses, and you have a dense geometry and you can jointly optimize it. It's just that now the geometry is encoded uh, in something like 32 numbers uh, living in the in the bottleneck of that of that pre-trained autoencoder, so that's that's the basic idea, and these results you've already shown. You have already shown, but I repeated this because I wanted to show an extension of this system that we have we have recently done, um, called Scene Code, where we still we still keep this whole system here of color image to depth um, kind of branch of the network. So we have this open coder side for the depth. And then we've done the same thing for semantics. So we have again pre-trained, knowing uh, semantics in simulation, we've pre-trained the kind of um, semantic branch of it. And so now we have two codes, we have the code that represents the depth, so if we optimize that, we change that code, we change the depth map, and if we now change the, uh, the semantic code up here, we change uh, the semantics that are coming, coming out here. So at test time, again, we don't have ground truth semantics coming in, we don't have ground truth depth coming in, so we can just use these um, relatively compressed representations and optimize them uh, together, actually. So this is now a whole system put together. So again, built on top of code slam. <coughs> so keep in mind, this is a 
it's a monocular system, right? So the, the, the geometry uh, reconstructions are maybe not as impressive as in, in, in other results I've shown before. This is purely monocular, and it does the reconstruction of, of here a couple of keyframes in terms of their motion. Uh, the 3D geometry in the form of uh, depth maps and semantics in this case. So the, the semantic fusion part in this case is, is no longer uh, a kind of a probabilistic um, update, but you optimize for consistency across these frames. So in the, in here on the code slam side of things, you optimize for photometric consistency, and here we optimize for semantic. Uh, consistency with the, uh, the semantic code. So it's, it's kind of interesting how when you see the bed first, it's confused with something else, um, like a sofa, I think, and then you're going over, you can see the bed in its entirety, and then you can actually resolve this kind of ambiguity. And that's one of the advantages of this system. Okay, so just quickly, the way we have uh, trained this was using uh, CNET. You may, you may know about it, it's quite a big data set that you can, you can download where we have kind of randomized layouts, randomized uh, uh, object placement, and then of course ground truth, depth things in CS classes, and so on. And we've also recently taken this a little bit further, and uh, we've released uh, CNET, which is a quite large scale. Uh, sorry, interior net, which is a quite large scale um, photorealistic data set. We work together with this uh, startup company in China, Kojale, that have access to a huge database of layouts and objects. And we again randomized uh, trajectory through them and uh, using a realistic ray tracing based uh, rendering, we get these kind of uh, scenes. So you can go download that, it's now available. You can change lighting. There's also some changes in terms of object arrangements so that we can simulate somewhat uh, natural changes in the scene as you would find them in reality. And of course, you know, the usual ground truth, scene normals, uh, depth map. Well, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now of course we want to um, to use these kind of things on board actual robots. So some of my older works uh, go back to solar airplanes and then flying inside mines. But uh, yeah, I want I want to go back to this kind of field work. Uh, but more recently we have mostly focused on also just getting the controls right. So we have uh, we have gone from uh, linear model predictive controllers towards modeling the full nonlinear dynamics of, of our drones um, and posing the thing as a nonlinear model predictive control problem. I'm slightly running out of time, so I'm not going into too much details here, but just to show you the kind of things that we can do now. Um, I hope you can see this rotor here is actually completely stopped. So as a side effect of modeling the dynamics um, fully as a, as a, as a physics-based system, you can then, you can, with the knowledge of having a, a rotor that has actually failed, we can still fully control the uh, position and orientation of this drone. It's actually not as trivial as it might seem, because one of the things we have to do to keep the yaw stable is to keep inverting one of the uh, other rotors. So we can't really quite see it in the, in the, in the video because it's quite fast, but it has to keep going back and forth in order to keep the, keep the yaw. So this is one of the things we can do in terms of control. Um, another thing, and here's where I, I really would like to now get the um, vision back in the loop, is we have equipped a drone with a, with a robotic arm, with a delta arm, and there's a, a whiteboard marker attached to the end here. So again, with the fully kind of uh, model predictive physics based control, we can anticipate getting the drone in contact with a whiteboard and can start drawing stuff on there. 
So you have, you have force control in one dimension and you have position control, two-dimensional position control in the natural two dimensions. And uh, it's still a bit slow, this is still quite early work. And keep in mind the drone is actually blind. In this case, this is, this is in our uh, Viking arena. Um, we are not using any visual feedback, but I really want to do that now. Um, but yeah, the drone is kind of blindly writing stuff, so next thing, next thing should hopefully be a bit better. But that's the kind of output uh, we, are, we are getting at the moment. And again, yeah, hopefully very soon this will be all linked together with dense 3D geometric um, and semantic understanding of the world. All right. <coughs> I'll, uh, I'll stop it here. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh. Yes, you're working in uh, 3D team, uh, which is very well.